Hi, my name is Connie Dunn. Thank you for coming today. My background is in journalism, and for about 30 years I was a freelance writer, uh, writing for magazines and newspapers. I lived in Texas then, and I, I even worked for places like Prentice Hall and, and Taylor Publishing, doing work for them. And then I got into um, writing books <laughs> and writing children's stories. I did a lot of volunteering at my church, uh, writing stories for, for um, the service. And so I just kept writing and writing and writing. And now I have loads of stories, and I have been publishing them. But I've also um, done an awful lot of work with goddesses. In fact, I have been doing goddess work for probably about 30 years. And I thought I would tell you, you know, all the goddesses have, have different aspects to them. I mean, they're, they're definitely fiction. Uh, we, you know, they all have these fantastic ways of being born. So, like uh, with, um, like with several of them, uh, they split open Zeus's head and out pops some, <laughs> some goddesses, and that was Athena. And then when they killed Medusa, they took, beheaded her, and she gave birth to Pegasus. And let me see, I can't remember the other one right off the top of my head. Let me just see. Well, I'm not sure, but she gave birth to, to a couple of things. And um, that would just go right into, uh, actually, my telling of Medusa. I'm going to actually read a lot of it to you. Uh, this is out of the book, and these are all uh, journals. And so they have the story of the goddess, but then they also have aspects like Medusa is all about um, abuse, sexual abuse, actually. She was raped, and you're going to hear this in here. And so it's about personal safety, her personal power, and having your personal power. And uh, all the other goddesses have their own aspects as well. So there's a lot of different ones. Uh, and this is a curriculum that I also wrote uh, to talk about uh, the different goddesses in a different way so you can learn more about them. It's not a journal. It's actually a, more like a curriculum. But you could use it as an individual or in a group. And these are, are definitely, there's going to be 12 of them. But at the moment, I think there's only like eight of them. So, um, so these are, this one is Hecata, and this one is a Native American one, Salu Corn Woman, and Salu Corn Woman. I also, as you can see, I made the, made the quilts. This is what I made to uh, make the covers on them. I did the, so this is, this is uh, Salu Corn Woman. This is Quan Yin. See her hands, she has lots of hands. And she has money coming out of her hands. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> and this is Hestia. She's the goddess of the hearth. So she's got the flames of the hearth on her. And this is Daya. Very important one because she's the planet Earth. So she's got the planet Earth right there. And then this one down here. Um, you can probably see the spider quite nicely. That is... Um, Spider Woman, which is also Native American. And so it has a spider, and you see this is a spider web. And she wove the universe. And then the big one with the big head, whoops, is Amaterasu. And she's a Japanese sun goddess. I don't have the edges finished on any of the quilts. I and intended to get them framed, but I don't have them framed yet, but I will be. Someday, <laughs> at some point, get them all framed. Um, so as you can see, this goddess is Quan Yin. She's also, she could be Japanese or Chinese. She comes from both, uh, both traditions. She's uh, known in both places. And so this is the cover, and this is the quilt. So you can see they're very much alike, or at least pieces of them are. So I think I'll just tell you the story of Medusa. It's uh, adapted, this is an adapted story from Greek mythology. Medusa was a, the mortal one of three sisters, 
Uralay, Lima, and Medusa. So Medusa was said to be beautiful as well as a priestess of the goddess Athena. So she worked in the temple and every night she would be the person that cleaned up after the whole day of people going into the temple and cleaning it up and making it right for the next day. Medusa was beautiful. She had long golden tresses. Her face was beautiful, sweet face. Disposition was friendly. Uh, most people liked her. Her parents were four seas and Sito. Sito was a sea goddess, known also as goddess of the dangers of the sea. And four seas was a sea god and a merman. Medusa knew that it had nothing to do with her looks because she was often found admiring her own reflection in copper doors of the temple. So she knew that she was, was nice looking. But one night, as Medusa was tending Athena's temple, Poseidon came to her, and he told her that his, her beauty was captivating and he must have her. Medusa tried to deflect his attention, but he returned the next night and the night after that and the night after that, just constantly coming in. And finally, uh, she had refused his attention uh, up to one night when she just couldn't quite get him away and basically Poseidon raped her, impregnated her, of course, uh, and Athena was furious because they had defiled her temple. So she couldn't do much to Poseidon because he was a god. So she decided to punish Medusa. So what did she do? She turned her hair into snakes, and she also made her eyes so that if you looked at them, you would turn to stone. So that wasn't enough that she had just done that. She also abolished her and put her in a, a very, it's called the Hyper Hyperborean lands, which was kind of way off, kind of, I guess, like a desert or something. And so Medusa was not going to be turning any innocent people into stone because she was so far away. Well, King Polydectus sent Perseus on a mission to bring back Medusa's head. Because at this point, Medusa was a monster as far as anybody was concerned because her hair was snakes, and if you looked at her, her eyes would turn you to stone. But if they lopped off her head, then of course they would have gotten rid of that. Well, Hermes also gave uh, Perseus some winged sandals so that he could fly rather than walk to his destination. And Hades, he had acquired a cap that made him disappear, which was probably the best tool that Perseus had. So while the sandals helped Perseus get to the land where Medusa was living in isolation, the mirrored shield helped him see Medusa without looking into her eyes. The sword was used to lop off Medusa's head. Remember that Medusa was pregnated with Poseidon. So when her head was lopped off, out popped Pegasus, a winged horse, and Chrysaor, Chris I don't think I'm saying that quite right, <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's a large winged bear. It's the first time I've actually heard of uh, the large winged bear. I think everybody probably knows about Pegasus uh, as the winged horse. We've seen that a lot of times. Um, so this story is, was relayed to me by Medusa. Um, she doesn't make a big deal over the rape. What she was really most uh, upset over and was, was indignant about is being punished for something that wasn't her fault. And I think a lot of people can, can relate to that, that she was, um, you know, she did nothing. She tried to deflect the, the attentions of, of uh, Poseidon, but she couldn't get rid of him. He just kept coming back every night and... Finally, he just uh, over, overran her. So she wanted her story told, and she was the victim, and she was punished in a way that took her life even before her head was taken. Uh, there was no life if she's going to be abolished to some desolate land. So her story is about, not about you feeling sorry for her, 
She wants justice. That's really what she wants. And so, like most things, we cannot go back and change any of these things. And we do have to remember that Medusa is part of mythology. So it's not an actual thing that happened, although they're gods and goddesses, and people have worshipped them long ago and has resurfaced, I would say, probably in the 1960s, people kind of brought back um, the neo-paganism and goddess lore, of course, came with that. And so there are a lot of people who look at the, the goddesses and uh, want to worship them. But what she really wants you to know is that when you see an injustice, try to right it or try to make it better. So that is her, it's her words. Now, in the, the um, journal that you would get if you got Medusa's journal, uh, then that would be all about finding your own personal power, social justice issues and personal power to make those choices. So she wants you to go write those. And I really can't blame her. That's a good thing to do. Now, as you can see, there's, there's plenty of other goddesses here on the table, and each one has their own unique story. The next one I have is Yama, Yama Ya. And some people say it Yamaya, but that is a nice English version of that. And there are children, I think, that are, have those names. But this is Yamaya, and where um, Medusa was from the Greek mythology, Yamaya is actually from West Africa. The Yorubans, actually, is, the, is more specifically. So that is uh, where she comes from. Now, Yam Yamaya is a dream goddess. So she comes to you in your dreams. She's not the pretty little mermaid goddess that you might see on TV or in a movie. No, she was definitely not. Um, her home is a river cave in West Africa that connects to the ocean, and some people call her mother of the night. Close your eyes, she says. I will bring you a dream. If you are seeking a mermaid, you may find her. But like I said, she's not the mermaid of Hollywood. She is a dark-skinned, large-breasted, large-boned mermaid with the strength of a killer whale, but the heart of a dolphin. Her domain is dark and cozy and tantalizingly familiar. And the reason it feels familiar is her cave is the womb of promise that our souls seek. Her voice comes to us like the ocean crashing into her, the rocks, yet we return lured by the spray that touches us deep inside ourselves. We close our eyes to absorb the ocean sounds and the breeze that blows in our face and the taste of the salt that gets into our mouth. We fall into a dream. We sleep. We return to our homes far from the ocean, yet we often return to the sea over and over again. Into your slumber, the smell of the sea will come, and you will search for Yamaya endlessly on beaches. But you must go into the dark cave where shells and pearls are stacked to the ceiling and find the reflecting pool where she, Yamaya, watches her daughters, all of the women, all of the women of the world she has given birth to. That's what she claims. I'm sorry, men. I don't know where you came from. <laughs> but in this story, only the women are born to Yemaya. So Yemaya calls to her daughters. You will not meet her by chance. She seeks you out and calls to you through some ancient song that rides on the waves of the sea and takes flight on the winds that blow through your hair. And as the snowflakes fall, you will still remember the salty taste of the ocean breeze. When you taste it in the middle of the ice and snow, you will want to go nap and go with her, fly from the cold winter of your world, and lavish in the warmth of your mother's embrace in the cave of dreams on the ocean of possibilities. Go, dream. Dreams are not an escape from life as much as they are part of life that is secret and sacred. Yimaya will teach you how to dream if you hear her call, for she is the mother of the night. 
who rocks you to sleep and whispers dreams into your ears. As the winter dark engulfs, into, engulfs our days and many struggle to fight against the darkness as if the dark were an evil lurking to suck us into a black hole where we would be stuck forever. Instead, Yamaya whispers soft encouragement into the night of your ear and tells us to dream of silver moons and unicorns and other maiden delights. Because the winter night is the birth of another year of promises and dreams are born from crones and mothers alike. Yamaya whispers into the darkness to come to her. We must listen for her so that our dreams can take shape. Here in the darkness of the womb of time, Yamaya breathes life into the dreams that wash over us like the waves in the ocean. Here is where the dreams are born to create the reality of the next year. Here is where Yamaya, the dream goddess, whispers a dream into your ear. Here is where tomorrow is born. Yamaya gives birth to us again and again by giving us dreams each year on the longest night of the year. That would be solstice and it hasn't come yet. It will be December the 21st here. That's the longest night of the year. She whispers in our ear and our dreams take shape of reality. Some believe that without a dream, life would no longer exist. Have you met Yamaya? If you have not, close your eyes and search for her on the beaches of all the oceans and then go to the caves and you will find her there. There by the reflecting pool watching for you. For she calls to her daughters on this night, the longest night of the year. That is where I met her and how I know. Yamaya and her story. Okay, I'll tell you one more story. And then you can ask questions if you'd like. Amaterasu is my next one. I don't believe I have her book here. I'm not sure. Let me see what number she is. No, she, uh, she hasn't been published yet. But, um, I guess I should tell you that Yamaya, I guess you could tell, um, Yamaya was the personal dream, so she would bring you a personal dream. And, and uh, Amaterasu is about believing in yourself. So that's what this story is about. Amaterasu is the sun, Japanese sun goddess. And she's this beautiful one with a puff head here. Let me lift her up again so that you can see her. So this is Yamaya, and I don't mean Yamaya, I mean this is Amaterasu. On the last story here, <laughs> this is Amaterasu, and she looks like a sun because she is the sun goddess. That's who she is. So this story is intended to um, kind of introduce you to Japanese, the Japanese goddess Amaterasu. And my resources, of course, are Japanese Shinto folk tales, which is where Amaterasu comes from. There are loads of the stories out there, so not all versions of the stories jive, but that's the way folklore is. Amaterasu is the Japanese sun goddess. She rules over the heavens and watches over the earth. There in the heavens, Amaterasu supervises the building of an irrigation canal, the growing of the rice. In Japan, rice is the most important part of agriculture. Many families with very small plots of land grow rice to feed their family. Amaterasu shines upon these plots and helps the rice grow. She digs around her crops in heaven and her cheeks get red from the, from the work. That's the reason why her cheeks are very pink on her. And below on earth, the people dig around their crops and their cheeks get red from the heat of their work. Matarasu wipes her brow as the people wipe theirs. Growing rice is hard work and a Matarasu shines down upon the fields to pull the plants up from their roots where they can flourish and grow. At the end of the day, Amaterasu retires to her weaving hall, where many women live and spin in her celestial palace. As she retires, her brother, the moon god, takes 
his place in the heavens, shining and radiant, but not so brilliant as Amalarasu. They have another brother named Sushanawa, who has a fierce temper and was given to cruel acts. Susanawa was given domain over the seas, but he was displeased that his sister held greater powers. When he came to the door of heaven, he told his sister that his intentions were honorable. He only wanted to pay homage to their mother. Amaterasu loved her brother, so she believed him and allowed him to enter into heaven. But Susanawa was jealous of Amaterasu, and his anger came crashing out as thunder and lightning he stormed through the heaven, and he blocked up the irrigation canals to keep the water from flowing to the precious rice plants that Amaterasu so carefully tended with her people. Susanawa scared himself as he stomped and thundered and spit lightning. He was angry and stopped upon the rice plants, and when all seemed devastated, he turned his attentions to the weaving hall. He broke the looms where the women were weaving the celestial cloth. Amaterasu was filled with rage and fear as well, and that scared her. She had never felt that before. The sacred looms had fallen on women and sent several to the land of the dead, yet Amaterasu refused to fight her brother. Instead, she went into the cave of heaven and rolled a large rock across the entrance, sealing herself inside. Retreating into the cave caused all the daylight to cease, so the people on the earth no longer had warm rays falling on their tender rice plants growing on the earth. No longer did she help pull the plants out of the ground and into her warmth. The earth fell dark. The other deities in heaven sent Susanawa away and agreed to punish him for his destructive behavior and banished him from heaven forever. What their larger challenge was, was to get Amaterasu to come out of her cave. On earth, the rice paddies lay in ruins in the, in the darkness. The people did not stay in their houses and mourn. They came out and found other activities to do. Just as in heaven, the other deities continued their own routine. They wanted to lure Amaterasu out of her cave and back to her celestial duties. They talked among themselves and decided on a plan. First, they hung a mirror outside her cave. Then they all sat together, laughing at the stories of the playful shaman Amanozuman, goddess of mirth and laughter. Amaterasu heard the laughter and thought they did not need her because they could have fun even in the darkness without her radiance upon them. Although she bowed to herself never to leave the cave, she could not risk Amanozumi, who began to dance. The others joined in. And they began to clap and to sing. Amaterasu got curious to see what was going on, so she peeked through the crack. And when she did, she didn't see them dancing. She saw her own reflection. It startled her. She had never seen herself. She jumped back in that startle, startling way. And then slowly she peeked through the crack again, and she saw her own image brilliantly reflected back to her. She liked what she saw. It was then that Amaterasu knew her own beauty. She rolled back the stone and stepped from the cave. She saw her entire image. It was the first time for her. She had never seen how beautiful and amazing she was actually like. And she kind of liked what she saw. The others closed off the cave of heaven. Amaterasu did not go back. She smiled upon her people of the rice fields, and again the daylight was returned to the heavens. Amaterasu learned how to use her own power. Each time Susanawa returns into the, turns into the storm god, she knows just how to stop him, not by fighting him, but knowing she has the power over light and dark. Amaterasu became another one of my favorite goddess stories to tell. She invokes happiness within my soul and makes me feel the warmth, the warm sun on my face. So that is the goddess that I plan to talk to you about today. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Could you show us one of your journals and how it's laid out and tell us some of the benefits of journaling? Yes, 
yes, I sure can. Journaling is something that a lot of people do. Um, I'm going to say mostly women. That doesn't mean that men don't journal. Men do. Um, there's a table of contents, and in it, it tells you about the goddess, uh, learn about the goddesses and the focus, and how to use this personal goddess journal. And they tell you the story, Oya, oh yeah, and the focus highlight, because each one's going to have a different one. And there are also pictures throughout that you can color if you're into coloring. It's also a very meditative thing to color. And so the, the story is here. And the focus highlight. So this is all about motherly love because this one is Selu Corn Woman. And then we get into the reflection. And so I've asked some questions. And this one I say, let us get comfortable, breathe deeply, blow your breath out slowly, and do this cleansing breath three times until you feel relaxed. Think about a time when you were a recipient of motherly love, which could come from your biological mother or a mother figure in your life. How did it make you feel? What were the circumstances around this situation? And then I give you a place that you can answer that. And then I give you another thing to think about, a time when you exhibited motherly love toward another human. Your children are other people. It doesn't necessarily have to be a child that you use that with. You could, it could be even a nephew or a niece or younger sibling, or for that matter, it could be an older person that you were being very motherly to. What were the circumstances surrounding that event and how did it make you feel? So then there's a place to answer that. And then we're going to go into the second part, which are the daily journal pages. And so I have coloring pages, and then there is um, a daily page and I'm going to ask you three questions and in this one is today I feel my mother's love by and then the second question is today I felt motherly too and who is that uh, by and then today I felt motherly to some non-human entity maybe it was a maybe it was a, a, a pet or something so then that's something that is asked every day and there are then also doodle coloring pages so you can doodle. If you're into Zen doodle you just you know make your squiggly line and then put some doodles in like circles and um, squares or triangles any of that and then you could color them in. And so the rest of the book is actually filled with the very same thing so there were there for 30 or 31 days. Well, anywhere from 28 to 31 days. So there's plenty of room if the month passed 31 days. So that's the whole idea is to do it as a monthly. Did I answer your question? You have anyone has a, another question? Yes? If one wants to learn more about goddesses, what are some good resources? Well, there's a lot of information online, but if you're really wanting to know more about goddesses, you could actually buy this guide. It's learning from the ancient goddesses of the indigenous cultures from around the world. This is a 12 session goddess course for groups and individuals. So it is set up so that you could do this alone at home and it's set up for each chapter has a, a different goddess and it has a lot of information in here uh, about how to work with your, your uh, goddesses. And then it has the stories and has some um, has some has some activities so there's some there's some essays and that sort of thing in here so each one has each each session has some general information uh, it has uh, has tells you how to set up your altar does anyone have an altar at home those are nice uh, to, to have uh, the personal altars and you can put things on them that are sacred to you and so then you call in the directions and you call upon your foremothers and then you uh, might read this essay and then the story and then you would um, do a planned activity which is all written out and tells you what to do 
And so each session is a little bit different. And of course, they each have different goddesses. But they are the same goddesses that I have here for the most part. And I can give you bookmarks, and this tells you before you leave. I definitely want to do that. That tells you my information. It has the personal goddess journals on the front, and in the back it has all of my information. And I can be reached at uh, publishwithconnie at gmail.com. That's publishwithconnie, all lowercase, jammed together, at gmail.com. And so it also tells you where you can buy these journals. All you have to do is to go to amazon.com slash author slash Connie Dunn, and all of that's lowercase and no spaces. So that is uh, how you would reach me. And uh, before you leave, I want everyone to take a copy of this so that you'll be able to find the, the books and buy them for yourself. There will be 12 of them. Like I said, I'm not quite all the way through publishing them, but uh, I'm in the middle of it. Thank you for coming, and if you have other things to say, I'll be here afterwards.